All right, we'll go ahead and get started here as a few more uh, people join us. Uh, thank you again for uh, coming to another virtual webinar here at Camera West. Uh, today, we are excited to talk about the Leica S3 with Mr. Ray Olson from Leica. Uh, he has uh, a unique presentation and hopefully some new interesting information we can all learn from on the new S3 and its capabilities, uh, what he thinks of it, and uh, we'll get some special insight on that. Uh, if you do get disconnected from the webinar, uh, please refer back to the email that was sent out to you. Uh, you can just go ahead and click that link again. It will open up the webinar and you should be able to reconnect. If you can't, uh, we will post this webinar along with our other webinars on our blog, uh, camerawest.com forward slash blog, and you'll be able to go back and watch those and uh, get any more information uh, that you might not have picked up during the live uh, bit. So without any more uh, further ado, oh, well, one more thing. Uh, if you want, go ahead and leave questions in the Q&A section or in the chat. Uh, we'll circle back at the end uh, of Ray's presentation and uh, get to as many of, the, many of those questions, if not all of them, uh, that we can. Ho hopefully, some of them might be answered within the presentation itself. But if not, we'll do our best. Yeah. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn this over to Ray and let him have at it. All right. Good afternoon, all. So um, my name is Ray Olson. I'm the uh, product uh, specialist for the Western region uh, for Lucky USA. Um, and I've been uh, working with the S cameras since uh, the S2 came out, actually. So uh, for many, many moons now. So this is the latest iteration of the camera. Um, so basically, oops, oops, here, here we go. Um, we're basically just going to get into a little bit of the heritage for folks who maybe are not familiar with the camera, some of the photo features, some of the video features, uh, workflow capabilities, uh, Leica S lenses and their adaptability, uh, or other lenses adapted to the system as well. And then proof of performance uh, we have, and there's some on the Leica website too that you can actually download uh, raw files from. Um, the heritage of the Leica system started back in 09 with the uh, S2 camera. Um, and then the S2P, so two different S2 cameras, same camera essentially. Uh, 37 and a half megapixel uh, Kodak ISS uh, CCD sensor. Uh, same thing with the 006 camera, was also a Kodak ISS uh, CCD. Uh, so the same sensor for both of those cameras. And then uh, over the years, we brought out different lenses. When the camera was launched, we had the 70, the normal lens, and the 180. And then in 2010 came the 35, the 120. Uh, the, the grip, we brought up the Pro Charger, uh, and then 2011, there's some adapters that came out for other camera systems, uh, for um, most uh, notably Hasselblad H, Hasselblad uh, V, and also uh, Contax 645. Uh, both the Hasselblad H and the Contax 645 lenses do autofocus on the S cameras, all of them. Uh, so any of those on the used market, there's some great long lenses out there that we don't manufacture. So there's some really some cool lenses out there that you could get to adapt to the S camera. Then we came out with the 30. And then in 2012, when the 006 came out, we came out with more of the adapters. Um, and then the L Pro for the 180, which is the close-up diopter for the uh, 180 lens to get you in a little tighter. Uh, more like the motion picture lenses operate. Instead of extension tubes, we're going with close-up diopters out front. Uh, the, the 180... Uh, uh, L Pro, like I said, then the 24 uh, millimeter lens, and then the 120 tilt and shift, which unfortunately is on the way out. I believe that uh, since we co-developed with uh, Schneider on this particular lens, I believe that Schneider is no longer in the game on this particular lens, and they don't want to do it anymore. So, all right, that's so much for that. So, scarf them up while you can. Uh, we came out with a, a couple of cases, a hard case for the camera at that point too. The 30 to 90 zoom came out. Um, and then a, a different grip for the uh, uh, 006 camera. Um, and then the CS lenses started coming out, the central shutter lenses, which allow you to flash sync at all shutter speeds up to a thousandth of a second uh, at any flash power. So you're not limited to high speed sync, which we have available on the camera with speed lights also. But if you wanted uh, a lot of studio flash power and you want shutter speeds up to a thousandth of a second, that's what the CS lenses are fantastic for. So they're, <clears throat> excuse me, leaf shutter lenses. 
and then the 45 millimeter lens came out and then the CS 180 lens and then the 100. Um, I'll, I'll kind of scramble through this a little bit quicker. I would bore you all the tears with some of this stuff. Then the 007 came out in 2015 at NEB. Um, and that was uh, so, sort of codenamed uh, Hollywood because it was uh, the first camera with uh, video uh, capability for a medium format camera from our line. So um, we had a great video capability on the camera, but uh, APS-C size um, crop factor. Um, and then today we're looking at the brand new camera, or as of now, we're looking at S3, just starting to ship. Um, what we're looking at as far as features of the camera uh, and other things that, you know, we have a very unique visual, visual aesthetic. Um, it's mainly right now, it's a camera of choice for many European fashion photographers that is doing so many magazine covers. It's unbelievable how many covers this camera has right now um, from fashion magazines worldwide. Um, from my own personal experience, when I was shooting uh, many, many moons ago in the music industry, what made me more saleable to my uh, customer base was delivering a bigger transparency to them. So I started shooting medium format and that made me uh, instantly more saleable. It's kind of the same thing nowadays. I mean, it's really not gone away. I mean, a bigger image, a higher quality image sets you apart from the competition shooting with a smaller sensor. Um, and medium format's got a totally different look than 35 does, as most of you probably know. Um, it, there's a neat Thing about this camera too. I know it's kind of hard to see with this virtual background I got going here too, which is a Noctilux image I was telling Ben about, but it's the same uh, camera body as a 007 camera. It really is the same camera all the way around. It's the same functionality, the same body. Um, sensors different, obviously, and then the video capabilities are different. Uh, but aside from that, we kept a mirrored design. Uh, uh, the one reason for that uh, is that the mirror right now uh, gives us a better viewfinder than anything we've been able to find in EVF for a something that would absolutely knock your socks off uh, for a medium format camera. We can do it with a smaller camera, but not yet uh, for the big camera. They're just not seeing the technology there uh, today. Um, so that's, uh, but very, very cool. There's really nice stuff going on with this camera. Another uh, advantage that we don't even think about maybe with a mirrored camera is that it's not pulling battery power all the time. So the battery really lasts a long time on this camera. I've been able to go a full day or more even with a, an S camera, not have to worry about changing batteries. Whoops. So the materials of the camera are, pretty, are all the same. We're stainless steel lens mount like we've always been, very high. Uh, shutter uh, durability. We've gone to 150,000 exposures now for a guarantee. Uh, we have put a three-year warranty on the camera now going forward. So it's three years uh, without any, it's just what it is. It's three years out of the box. Um, uh, uh, LAN, uh, WLAN GPS is built into the camera. Uh, very clean HDMI out. So super, an uncompressed HDMI out signal. Um, speed and mobility of the camera, we're still looking at three frames a second. The 007 was three and a half frames a second at 37 and a half megapixels. We are now 64 megapixels at this new generation sensor and still able to give you three frames a second. Uh, so it's way faster than studio flash. Normally we're going to beat a studio flash about a second, second and a half between pops. So it's way ahead of that and up to a thousand shots on a battery. Um, this next generation 64 megapixel CMOS sensor uh, is Gorgeous, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it a little later, but Maestro 2 processor, there's been no need to go uh, to the Maestro 3, which we put in the SL2. Uh, the SL2 needs it because of the more robust video functions and the EVF running all the time. So the processor really is, is helping out with that. Uh, by not having an EVF in this camera, we uh, again have a mirrored view and we have a much more powerful battery. Uh, 15 stops of dynamic range, a true 15 stops out of this camera uh, is fantastic. You can pull shadow detail out that you never even thought was there. I mean, you don't even see it on screen until you start pulling it up. It's wild. Uh, really nice to have, uh, just that extra. Um, the 10 like S lenses and then the six with the central shutter. Uh, so we've got 10 different focal lengths and then six are duplicated up with uh, central shutters if you want for uh, studio flash. Um, and then motion now uh, in the camera is now 4K cinema DCI over the entire sensor size. So you've got the entire width of the sensor, I should say. It's not the entire sensor size because it's a movie crop. So you're looking at a 45 millimeter wide 
uh, sensor, which is putting you now into the big format, uh, medium format uh, motion picture camera size. In still in a DSLR camera. Um, I can't say that this is, if you're doing full bore cinema all the time, this is not your camera of choice. But when you have a camera that's doing stills and is able to do a fantastic clip uh, along on the job, I mean, that's really nice to have. So the new sensor is the same size. It's 30 by 45 millimeters. Uh, so instead of 37 and a half megapixels, we are now 64 megapixels. Uh, there is a, a new bear pattern over the top where they've, uh, they've been working on tweaking the color balance uh, of the flesh tones essentially in the red channel uh, is more accurate than it's ever been. Um, and it was not bad before in my humble opinion. Uh, it was great. And I do people a lot. So I never found any overpowering reds, but it's been fine tuned a little bit. Um, no low pass filter like we never have used on any of these cameras. So you've got the maximum detail. Um, we've got very low power consumption because the sensor was designed in such a way that it's not pulling power when it's off or asleep. Uh, so again, stretching battery power out and keeping the noise down so there's no heat buildup in the camera. Um, super fast pixel readout. Uh, so you've got a, uh, a much uh, more reduced rolling shutter effect in the video mode. If the camera's we talk about rolling shutter for just a second. If the camera's mounted on a tripod, you're panning slowly, or it's rigged on a slider or a jib or something like that, you don't really see rolling shutter much anyway, because you're not making such a jerky movement that you would force rolling shutter to have that uh, movement. Uh, you, you sometimes find it more with um, stills when you're panning with the subject, because the shutter writes in rows, you'll get sometimes a stepped image one way or the other. It depends on which way you're panning. Um, we're using uh, dual gain technology, which is essentially um, a, a technology that another company owns that we license, uh, everybody licenses from them. Actually, I think, uh, I believe the company is called Aptina. Uh, I think everybody licenses from the same company if you're doing dual gain technology. Uh, it, it essentially, because a sensor uh, is not like film, a sensor has basically a speed and then gain is added to give you different ISOs. Um, that's basically how a digital sensor works um, in relation to when you change ISOs, it's not really changing anything other than it's the same exposure coming in, or same light, light coming in, but the gain applied to the sensor is different. So they can now apply a different gain to low ISOs and send a separate one to high ISOs. So we get pretty, pretty amazing results, even at 50,000 ISO with this camera. Um, I've still got a, I've got a pre-production model, so I'm not 100% sure whether 50,000 is uh, completely done on the model I've got. I'm sure it's not. Uh, because I'm still at a pre-production firmware. Um, and then, of course, image circle is 54 millimeters, like all the other S lenses. Um, and then a crop factor, if you're thinking about the lenses that we have on the camera, if you want to get back to 35 millimeter equivalents, it's a 0.8. So uh, a 70 millimeter lens, the normal lens equates to a 56. A 24, uh, the wide angle lens we make for the camera, is equivalent to a 19 millimeter lens. Uh, the 100 F2, which is one of my favorites, is more like the 80 millimeter Sumalux. So it's an 80 millimeter lens and you're also uh, calculating uh, not just focal length, but you're, you have a crop factor essentially for aperture. So you actually, you know, you gain a different look when you're using uh, a lens like this on a larger sensor. Um, this next generation CMOS sensor is fantastic. I mean, uh, this was shot, uh, I think, by uh, John on the East Coast uh, in... Uh, I'm not sure, it might be in Philadelphia. I'm not 100% sure where this was shot. Um, but it's 70% more resolution than the 007, which is, the 007 was fantastic. I had no problems with that. But now I've got more resolution, it's even better. Um, I've actually resed up a file in testing period, uh, the testing period of the last six months um, to 20 feet. Um, and I'll show you the image later that's kind of a, a hack image. It's not direct, quite done yet, but I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about later. A very minimized uh, moray effect. I mean, as we get smaller pixel uh, sizes, uh, uh, the site size, as it gets smaller, I mean, it, it automatically starts correcting for moray. When people were at 12 uh, microns, at six microns for a pixel well size, uh, you started having moray in a pattern like this. So as the uh, pixel sites get smaller, we actually have less moray. There's uh, a little bit of moray here, but it's so easy to take out in software. Uh, and you will find it still on some patterns, but on, um, 
um, lay down like denim and stuff like that. I mean, Levi's is shooting. Anybody that's shooting denim knows they run into a moray pattern all the time on the older digital backs and even the, the older um, S camera uh, would potentially run into moray at a certain pattern, a certain distance away from the, the pattern. 15 stops of uh, dynamic range. Uh, this was something shot in Germany uh, that Ollie did. And it's, a, it's an amazing uh, sensor for pulling information out. There's detail in the deepest blacks and there's a detail all the way to the uh, zone nine area, zone nine and a half, even zone 10. It's got detail. 50,000 ISO is amazing. Just, you know, for somebody sitting in the backseat of a car, uh, blast off a frame in the production, um, so the GPS and <laughs> the radio and just, uh, wild stuff that you would never really think you'd be able to do with a medium format camera. Um, the central shutter <clears throat> really gives us uh, some fantastic uh, capabilities of overpowering the sun or getting the aperture you need on location without having to go to high speed sync. Uh, if you need 6,000 6, watt seconds to get this shot, you can sync at 6,000 watt seconds at whatever aperture you need. You can't do that with high speed sync. Long exposure time now has been extended to eight minutes. Uh, at 100 ISO, it's eight minutes. Uh, it, it, it'll still do a dark exposure of another eight minutes. Uh, we cannot turn noise reduction off on this camera, uh, long exposure noise reduction. So you will still have an eight minute exposure followed by an eight minute dark capture. Uh, I've not really found a need to do an eight minute exposure, but I've done a couple of four minute exposures, which is not horrible. You walk away from the camera and come back and it's pretty cool. Um, but it gives you a lot of creative uh, possibilities for long exposures that we did not have before. We were 125 seconds max before, um, so it's quite a bit longer. And still with no noise. I mean, I'm not finding any noise at all. Uh, I haven't tried 1600 or 3200 ISO. I just didn't need it. Uh, exposures are too long. I'm sure some some of you will find a need for it though. Let us let us know. You know, whatever you need and stuff like that. We're very open to. Uh, Suggestions from the pro uh, market. That's where most of the developments come from and the pro cameras that comes from the pro market and uh, They are listening. Uh, I, I funnel everything up to Germany every time I hear it from a uh, from a customer The uh, <clears throat> fall off and separation of s lenses is very, uh, you know, it's very medium format like um, different than 35 or different than uh, large format. It's, it's it's in the middle like medium formats always been but you've got longer focal length lenses, so your in-focus point is uh, got more dimension to it uh, than, say, your out-of-focus points. Different than 35, because every picture you take with a normal lens here is a 70. Normal on a 35 millimeter camera is, you know, 50. We've always called it. <clears throat> so you have a longer lens. Same thing with your portrait lenses. You're going to have less depth of field, like the 100 millimeter F2 lens really looks, it equates to an 80 millimeter Sumalux, the 1.4 80 millimeter lens of the R system. Um, but it really looks more like a Noctilux. The 100 F2 is kind of like the Noctilux of the big camera. And now with the uh, expanded uh, use of the sensor size for a full 4K size, uh, 4K records to SD, uh, clean HDMI uh, is 1080 out uh, over, uh, over the HDMI to a recorder, uh, no 4K to recorder. So if you want to do 4K, it goes to card. Um, but most people are, if they need 4K or they need something else, this is not the right camera for them. But if they need a clip uh, for a client, I mean, the 1080 is unbelievable. So it does have an 87% wider uh, field than we had in the 007. The 007 there in the middle was Super 35. So that's like an APS-C size uh, sensor. And then full frame 35, uh, the next box out, and then the full box out there is the, uh, the width of the S3 sensor. So that's uh, pretty amazing. So you got really interesting looks. So the, um, the medium format Cine 4K is uh, basically an Apple uh, ProRes uh, MOV wrapper, uh, 422 color uh, sampling, um, 24 frames a second, a true 24 frames a second, 25 and 30. Uh, data stream up to 430 megabits and internal uh, built-in stereo uh, audio um, 48k 16-bit uh, and then external audio via the dongle cable that we made for the 007 the same cable so you could have an external mic and then headphones into that if you wish <clears throat> and then uh, uh, manual audio uh, level is controlled from the camera uh, focus peaking is on the camera like uh, when you go into live view on the camera but when you're shooting a uh, motion you're in live view so you have the different uh, functions of having a histogram on. Uh, you'd have uh, zebras in the uh, 
in video mode, you will have the capability of uh, focus, um, you see your focus peaking, and then having a level if you wish. Time code is uh, here as well. And then again, a, a very uncompressed, clean 1080p HDMI out. So to a separate recorder, if somebody wanted to do that. <clears throat> Workflow on the camera is uh, very efficient as it was on the 007. We're looking at uh, a wireless uh, in the camera, if you wish. Uh, it does go to the Leica Photos app. The latest app out in the App Store now supports the S3. Uh, so that just went out uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think. So you can actually control the camera. So it's like having a, you know, your iPhone is your remote control for the camera, essentially, uh, and a cable release that uh, operates, you know, within Bluetooth uh, uh, range, essentially. And uh, GPS tagged. So the GPS is built into the camera as well. So Wi-Fi and GPS. And then um, HDMI, HDMI out is a, uh, a C uh, size. And then USB 3 is the same way as 007 for it's a Limo connector to USB 3 for tethering. Um, the tethering software that we have, which is a free download from the website, uh, they've actually put it up on each camera's website that utilizes um, uh, these, uh, either the plugin for Lightroom or the image shuttle software is on the S3 page, is on the SL2 page. Uh, so you don't have to go digging around in the, uh, it used to be in the owner's section, it's not there anymore. There's also a support page on the site where you can look for software and it's also, and it's all free downloads. So image shuttle, uh, is a standalone application that when you tether the camera to the computer, you get live view. You can actually control your focus points from the camera. You can uh, a keyboard tether the uh, keyboard release the camera if you wish. Um, and then it's also the, this is the application that most people that are shooting with Capture One. If you're tethering to Capture One, uh, like an image shuttle will put your DNG file in whatever folder you wish, and then you have Capture One watch that folder as a hot folder. Uh, so it's instantaneous and I've been working now with it with um, all the latest iterations of uh, Lightroom with, uh, I'm a Mac guy, so I'm running the latest version of Catalina. Everything is running fine. Uh, the latest version of Capture One 2004 is running perfectly. Uh, everything is good. We're happy right now. It's all really, really good. Uh, no bugs anywhere. Knock on wood. <laughs> uh, and then um, Image shuttle to capture, uh, capture one, of course. And the Limo connector, uh, which I, let's see, I've got one here. If you guys can, you know, you can't see this thing probably. Well, maybe you can. This is our Limo connector, which is very much uh, a standard in the, um, in aviation, in, um, in NASCAR, in uh, other high speed cars, in uh, uh, high end motion picture cameras, you're using some form of a Limo connector too. So it's, not such a, uh, a weird connector that it was when the camera first came out. But they're looking at this case. It's one of these cables, though. When you plug it into the camera, you can hang the cable or hang the camera from the cable. And actually, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't recommend doing that, but it will hang on. Uh, it's uh, crazy how, how good a grab this is. Nice to see from some of the other ones that you know detach so rapidly from the camera. So we've always gone Limo on this, and we're the ones that make the cable. Love to see another manufacturer come up with a cable. We're the only ones that have it right now. So it goes USB 3 to Limo is our connection. Uh, over the years, this is the, the real the change is between the 007 and the S3. So in, in the sensor size is from 37 and a half megapixels up to 64. Um, same processor on board Maestro 2. Uh, same live view and autofocus function. So you have autofocus and live view over the entire screen. Um, when the mirror is down, you have uh, focus in the middle. Uh, it cannot be moved. It's always dead center. At least you know where it is. Uh, I've gotten so used to that that it doesn't bother me at all. And I, I honestly, I manually focus a lot anyway. So uh, it, it just doesn't bother me to even have it uh, in the middle. I know where it is. If I need it, I go right to the back back button on the camera. Because you leave it in manual focus, and your back button could be assigned for autofocus. Uh, any Canon users out there, you know, custom function four. That's what it did. Um, ISO now up to fifty thousand. So. Uh, from 100 ISO to 50,000 ISO. Uh, we kept the frame rate as up as high as we possibly could with a, uh, a big file coming in. Uh, two gig buffer on board. Uh, didn't really have any reason to up the buffer. Um, long exposure now out to eight minutes. And uh, we're running still the same card configuration in the camera. We're running uh, SD and CF uh, as we did on the, uh, as we've done, have done on all the cameras actually. Um, but, uh, 
You can actually use a UHS-2 SD card in the camera if you wish. The, the, the camera's really not going to take the advantage of the, uh, the added speed that you can actually write to a, a UHS-2 card. But when you get from the card to the computer, it'll be a faster transfer. So you could use either UHS-1 spec cards or two. Uh, it seems to work okay. And the compact flash, I don't know, up to UDMA-7. Uh, I'm not a compact flash person much anymore. I mean, once you, if you've ever bent a pin, you'll probably go right to, <laughs> right to an SD card. You can't bend anything on those. People have washed them. They've gone through the washing machine and they come out in their pants pockets and they're still fine. Um, lenses, uh, maybe a lot of you are familiar with it, uh, but maybe a lot of you aren't. We have everything from a 24 to a 180. Uh, one zoom, we have a 30 to 90 zoom, which is kind of like a 24 to 70 roughly. And uh, very high contrast uh, from close up to infinity. So the lenses are uh, beautifully corrected. Uh, they're all dust and moisture sealed. Um, the sharpness is fantastic from center to edge. Uh, very low distortion and chromatic aberration. That's something we design in every optic we do. We do, do the best job we can possibly do with um, the size of the lenses, the, the type of grinding, the type of uh, elements that go into it, whatever is necessary to make it correct, uh, like it does. Very low distortion, uh, no focus shift when you're stopping down. Uh, I have no focus shift with uh, funny colored filters. I've tried a bunch of different things uh, and it's good, no, no focus shift. So they're almost like Apple lenses, but you know, they're not Apple lenses unless they say so. And when we say Apple lens, that means we correct all three wavelengths. So it's RGB all focused at the same point. Uh, and, and then Aquadura coating, which is our coating for the lenses, uh, which is basically waterproof. Um, uh, everything. I mean, even salt water is, it just cleans right off. Um, and I shoot out by the ocean a lot. So I've had a chance to put it to the test. I usually don't use a UV filter. I use an ND filter or maybe a polarizer every once in a while. Uh, but I've not had need for, uh, unless you're around severe salt spray or sand or something like that, I would filter the lens. Um, but aside from that, uh, no, no real uh, added gain. Again, the 10 lenses we have, the focal lengths are um, 24, 30, 35, 45, 70, um, the 100 millimeter lens, uh, the 120 macro, uh, which is uh, patterned after the uh, R-series um, 100 2.8 Elmeret. Uh, so our 120 is unbelievable. The 100 and the 120 are fantastic lenses if you do uh, people. Uh, both of them are stunning headshot lenses. Uh, the wide angles are really fantastic. The 45 is probably my favorite because it's like a 35 on the 35 millimeter camera, or, or I still personally shoot 8x10 film, so it's like having a 250 or 240 lens on an 8x10 camera. So it's kind of like a 35 equivalent. Uh, which I like, a little bit wider than normal. And then the 70 millimeter lens is fantastic. It's got some fantastic close focusing capabilities that uh, really uh, go way beyond, I think, what a normal lens would normally do. And then the uh, leaf shutter lenses we have, and not all the lenses. Some of the lenses are physically too large for the shutter. They would need a larger shutter, which is no longer manufactured by anyone, uh, an electronic shutter. So we're building uh, a new shutter for these lenses. Um, and it's a specific size and it would radically change the size of the lens if we went and, and the price probably if we took a hundred f2 lens and put a uh, a, a shutter in it I, I don't think it would be affordable uh, it might be but I doubt it <laughs> somebody would be able to afford this but that way um, kind of the way that we're doing most of the new optics is uh, the in the in focus point the contrast is raised to the point where it looks more like a lens that would be a stop faster. It's kind of the, the vibe that you get from it. So if you look through a Summicron lens, it kind of looks like a Summilux. If you look through a Summilux, it looks kind of like a Noctilux. It's, it's really kind of cool what they're doing with uh, what they can do with tweaking um, in focus points and then watching, of course, your everything the way it falls off all the way to, to bokeh and uh, background blur and whatnot. So a much higher in focus point than other uh, manufacturers do, um, which, the more you add in contrast, it gives you uh, much more sharpness or the appearance of sharpness. Resolution, resolution on these right now, they're telling us we're good to way over 100 megapixels. So we've got room to grow still. So they're future proofed. Fall off on these is fantastic too. Uh, very clean fall off from center to edge as far as illumination goes. 
Uh, but still, you know, I, I, I will still apply vignetting to the you know uh, edges of a frame or edge burn like I would in the dark room. Uh, so I don't mind off, I, I don't mind mechanical vignetting sometimes, but it's it's not there. So you can just add it if you wish. The uh, adaptability uh, to, of the camera to other brand lenses on the market, um, uh, because when the camera first came out, we only had a handful of lenses, and now we, we still basically have our 10 focal lines pretty much covers everything you need, but we're not uh, making a longer lens at this particular point in time. I don't see that as being something that me, most people want. Um, we're not hearing it from the customer base. Initially, I think there was a 300 millimeter lens, or possibly a 350 in the original lineup of, uh, of the S2 camera as a prototype but it never materialized. So with Hasselblad and Contax having great three, um, 300 millimeter lens and 350 lenses on the used market, they're fantastic. <clears throat> the Pentax six by seven lenses, there's some fantastic, uh, gigantic, uh, you know, long lenses out there. I think even out to 800 millimeters. Um, and the Mamiya 645 lenses, so the phase one lenses, the Mamiya lenses, there was a 300 2.8 for the 645 at one point. That would be a, a stunning lens on this camera if you could find one of those. And then the V lenses. So you've got the Hasselblad V lenses all the way up to 500 millimeters. And then you've got uh, various wide angles and you've got uh, some uh, in the Mamiya 645 line. You can still find some of the tilt and shifts. So some cool stuff out there that you can adapt to the camera quite easily. Uh, a note on the Hasselblad H lenses. The only lens to my knowledge that doesn't work right now is the Hasselblad 24 millimeter lens. It came out a year or so after we brought the adapter out. So I don't know what the problem is, but it does not talk to it at all. I mean, you can actually shoot with it, but it won't stop it down uh, for some reason. It will not talk to the diaphragm. And they keep saying, there's nothing we're doing. Proof of performance, we've got some great images up on the Leica website. If you go to you know, leica-camera.com, the US website, uh, you can go to the S3 page and where it says, uh, uh, I, I believe it says, um, uh, S3 images. And then you have these images that are on the site. You can download the raw files of all of these. Um, thanks. I appreciate it. I'm gonna, guys, I'm going to show you some things in Lightroom real quick. I'm going to blast over to something. This was a, uh, hope you guys are all seeing the shots. <coughs> Excuse me. This was a shot that one of our guys in Germany did was a, I believe, a five exposure um, uh, vertical frame stitched together. Uh, this is about a 30 foot <laughs> <laughs> image that, that they've got in Vetzlar, it's, it's pretty wild. Uh, that's a fantastic image. And then we've got, uh, what do we got here? This is the one I was shooting on Highway 5, coming back from LA, coming back to the Bay Area. And I just, I grabbed the camera. Just, all right, I'm not tripod mounted, which is not me. I should be on a tripod, but okay, it's the 250th of a second at F11. Shouldn't even be stopped down that far. I thought these were dust spots when I first started going to about a 20 foot resolution and I realized they've got legs and they've got a shadow they're throwing at me. So those cattle about a mile or so, maybe even two miles off in the distance, which is pretty crazy. Um, that's amazing. Um, working on my Brett Weston vibe. <laughs> these are in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, this is some of the detail we're able to pull out of uh, the studio, uh, let's see if this draws fast enough. That's, you know, that's pretty stunning detail from uh, a fairly small hand holdable camera. It's not much bigger than um, most of your higher end uh, Nikon and Canon cameras as far as the size of an S camera. If you've not played with one, uh, very ergonomic. Uh, it's easy to grab. Uh, it's, not, it's not all that heavy in the grand scheme of cameras. I mean, it really is, it feels great in the hand. You've got lenses you can focus, you can go right to the focusing ring and focus them. Um, it can autofocus. You can uh, override autofocus right from the ring. Um, you don't have drive-by wire focus. That was a TIFF. That's a, that's one of these DNG. That's the DNG. This was a TIFF that Ollie made. What else do I have in here? This was the, the one they converted to black and white for the 15 stops of dynamic range. And it really is some fantastic uh, information in these places where there's just no. Well, if it draws fast enough here. These are big files. These are about 360 meg files that they've res these to. Um, gives you an idea. These are all, you can pull these off the website. The detail in this kind of stuff is really wild. In the library, well, let's see what this is. This might be 800% too. Now that's probably, that is probably 100%. Yeah, that's 100%. The other one, this is 800%. 
Oops, that's not what I want to do. So there's 800%. So it gets to be a little bit ridiculous. We're not usually looking at stuff at 800%. Um, that's the full frame. And then in one level, in two levels, it's 100% right there. And this is a conversion uh, to, to black and white. So this is really standing up to 8 by 10 film as far as I'm concerned. And uh, definitely better because the resolution is way beyond what uh, large format lenses can do. But it's got that vibe uh, that makes me very happy. This is a um, uh, single flash. Um, same. Skin tones are fantastic. Uh, it's one of those things where I have no problem whatsoever looking at skin tones. Oops, it's back here. All righty, <clears throat> got any questions out there? Not seeing anything in the Q and A. Got anything there, Ben? Nothing yet. If you guys have any questions, go yeah. ahead. Drop Fire them. away. <laughs> Ray gave us so much information. It covered um, at least most of my questions that I had. Um, anything you can think of that you're looking for off the top of your head? Um, I'm trying to think of anything you didn't cover. Oh, I saw something. Something's lighting up. <laughs> Somebody's doing something. Everyone, a few moments to populate their thoughts here. Uh, Gary had a question about uh, major differences between the 006 and the S3. What would be your points there? Well, S, the 006 camera was still a Kodak ISS uh, CCD. So a CCD is uh, a sensor that really needs to be lit. Uh, when you're looking at medium format CCD, um, you know, you, you can't really go beyond four, 800 ISOs really stretching it. Uh, CMOS really brings us to a different place where you could, I could shoot the 007 all the time at 6400 converted to black and white and it barely looks like TMAX 100. Uh, so there's a huge difference between CCD and CMOS as far as uh, ISO. Um, and if you're shooting, uh, with a ton of light, both of them are fantastic sensors, but you've got Again, 70% uh, more resolution uh, than you have in the 006 camera. So it kind of depends on how big you print. Makes sense. Um, are you seeing any autofocus improvements with the, with the, between the 007 and, and the S3? Yeah, I, when I initially got the prototype camera, when I put a lens on it, it just seems like it focuses faster. Um, whether it does or not, whether it's my imagination or not, I think they have sped things up a tad. But it's uh, it's the camera body itself that changed things. Uh, they, even though they haven't done much of anything, they must have found something because there was no firmware that changed anything on the lenses. Sure, makes sense. Uh, let's see. Yeah, a couple people wanted to know about the the differences in AF systems, or if there was any. Um, no, it's pretty much the same as the 007. So you've got, uh, when you go to live view, you have uh, the entire screen. You can pretty much focus over the entire screen uh, by moving the point around that way. There's no touch screen on the camera, so you need the joystick to be able to move the focus point. Uh, and when you're, when the mirror's down, focus point's always in the middle. Uh, but if you go to live view and you're on a tripod, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to try to live view the camera handheld and try to move my focus point. It's not me anyway. Somebody might want to do that, but I would rather be on a tripod. If you really wanted to do that, you could easily do that. You can move your, with the joystick, you can put your focus point anywhere you want. Um, let's see. Uh, Gary had another question about uh, using the 100 close focus for still life. Um, you can get in fairly close. I would probably want to, if you wanted to get in even closer, the 100 fantastic. It's a great lens. Um, you could get in a little bit closer by put, it's an 82 millimeter filter thread. So I would get a, a, a high quality diopter to put out front if you wanted to get in closer. That's kind of the way we do it with the motion picture lenses too. There are no extension tubes. It's all done out front. That way there's no exposure compensation whatsoever for an extension tube. And all of the, are all the, uh, 
focus screens and the replaceable focus screens in the that were compatible with S2, S006, and 007, are those all compatible with S3? It's the same, it's the same frame, yeah. Yeah. Same one. Uh, and the same accessories to the 007, when you're looking at the connectivity on the camera, it was a little bit different on the S2 uh, 006. Uh, some of the cables were a little bit different, but when you went to the 007, everything on the 007 is identical to the S3. Okay. So accessories are the same, the grip's the same. It's good to know. Um, Let's see, we, let's, we had a question about, uh, it, do you, have you tried the autofocus on the S3? Is it different in speed between using it in live view or using it through the optical viewfinder? No, it's the same. Uh, the lenses are basically the same. Uh, it's the motor and the lens that drives speed. Uh, even with the adapter we make for the SL2 camera, if you put an S lens on an SL2, you have the focus speed of an S lens. You're not gaining any focus speed like you have on the new SL lenses we're making with the you know dual motors that built in all the new Simicrons, so they're, they're focusing much, much faster. Plus, their uh, focusing groups are much lighter than we have in, in a bigger lens like the S lenses. So the mm -hmm. weight, physical weight of the focusing uh, element is, is uh, sort of hampering what you can do as far as speed makes yeah the uh one of the questions we're getting here um by a couple different people if they own or currently use either the 100 or the 120 is it worth getting the other one um is oh, there one or the other yeah <clears throat> i don't if, know kind of, do. go ahead is there, is there another part of the question uh, just mainly uh, mainly the differences between a 100 and a 120, are they worth owning at the same time or are they significantly different? They're, they're a different look. Um, like, um, you know, the, the, the 100 F2 looks more like uh, an 80 Sumo Lux. So it looks more like a, it is definitely a shorter focal length, but it looks more like a 1.4 lens as far as the way it renders in focus and out of focus points, uh, different than the 120. So the 120 now equates like to a 90, uh, or yeah, basically a, a, like the 100, 100 millimeter macro that we made for the R system. Um, so it is, it is a macro lens. So it's gonna get your focusing a lot closer. Um, it depends on what you do. You know, if you're working with a macro and you're used to macros, macros will tend to, and everybody's macros, if, if they don't catch an autofocus point, they're gonna run through the entire focus range from near to far uh, before you can get back to focus point. So if you help it in to where you're going, if you help it in closer, help it in uh, further away, it'll focus a lot quicker. And that's a macro lens in general, uh, whether it be made by us or Nikon or Canon or anybody, they're kind of all similar in the way they work. So the 100 Summicron would be a better studio portrait lens, I believe. Uh, the, I've used the 120 in the studio a lot, but I manually focus it when I'm doing people because they're not moving that much. I mean, I'm not moving that much and they're not moving that much. I mean, they got like an inch or so that people play. Um, so I'll manually focus it in that point. That way it, it doesn't get a chance to try to send itself off into uh, the full range of focus. Sure. That makes sense. I mean, they are significantly different. They're, they're significant enough in, in differences that... If you want a macro lens, the 120 macro is a better lens. Exactly. But if you're not using it for macro, they're both extremely sharp. Um, at 64 megapixels in both of these lenses, it's they're almost... They're, they're so sharp. <laughs> they're scarily sharp. Yeah. Very sharp. The, uh, I know we were speaking about this before uh, the broadcast, but there is a question here about the bit depth difference. We've spec'd it at um, uh, 14 because uh, that's the true capture. The, um, the, since the uh, S2 camera, the ADC converts, so the analog to digital conversion has always been 16 bit. Uh, it's always been essentially a 14 bit file in a 16 bit wrapper, which gives you the extra headroom to do whatever you want in post. Uh, you can go to 16 bit, you can go to 32 bit if you wish uh, in post and push it around on the back end. So it's got all the advantages. It's like putting, a, you've got all the tonal range and all the pushing around advantages you would have. If you had a 16 bit capture in a 16 bit wrapper, you've got nowhere to go. So if you've got 14 in the 16, it's the analog to digital conversion on board is 16-bit. 
So it's kind of the same thing they've always expected that. They've just gone to a different terminology now. It, it was a bigger deal, I think, back in the day of the S2, um, where there were other manufacturers on the market that had a 16-bit capture. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you're talking about 65,000 levels of tone you know, per color. I can't see that. I can't print it. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do with that, but, you know, they're big files. But you can easily uh, gain the... Um, what you gained from that was having like, really smooth gradations in uh, uh, tones, uh, mid-tones, skies, and stuff like that. You still have the same uh, with this. There's no difference in the way it records. It's, it's kind of the way it spreads it out over the entire sensor size. It's very, very uh, even, and you have an extended tonal range like you would have with a bigger piece of film. You're just you, you're pushing it over different levels. Yeah. So the, I, I was surprised that they actually specced it at 14, uh, but when I... I finally got an answer from uh, uh, product management that it's a 16-bit uh, DNG, but uh, there's 14 bits contained within that DNG. And that's what almost everybody in the world is doing right now. So I, I don't know. That's, that's what I heard. Sounds good to me. Um, as far as availability goes, I know we've, the S3 has begun the ship. Do you have any more information on, on, uh, deliverability of the of the s3 if people are looking to pre-order they're just getting the factory back up and running uh now uh because of covid19 so they've got um the factory's been shut down for uh, quite a few weeks now uh it's just back up and going and it's on a uh i'm not sure how many people are allowed to work and how long they're allowed to work per day that's not something that i really know for sure it's a german government thing there's only so much they can do yeah but that's that's really had an effect on delivering product well, if you are interested in pre-ordering one or getting on the list for S3 once they begin to ship, feel free to let us know. Uh, we will get your name down and uh, get one set up for you as soon as we possibly can. Um, if you have any other questions concerning the S3, feel free to drop us a line, um, pick our brains about it. We're, we're happy to help yep. as best we can. Um, I think that's all the questions we had today. Uh, thank you, Ray, for, for telling us a bit more about the S3 sure. and giving us a full rundown of where the S line has come from, or what, it's, what it's become with the, with the S3. I know we're all very excited to use it and play around with it. So. Yeah, it's a fantastic camera. It's still the flagship of the line as far as uh, image quality goes, uh, all of the other cameras are fantastic, as, you, as we well know anyway. But this is definitely, when you're trying to set yourself apart, from everybody else that's shooting a smaller camera, this really does the trick. Yeah, it's it is uh, it's exciting to see that this body is going to be able to to pull even more out of the uh, the incredible S optics that we've all come to love. So that and just uh, so everybody knows, I mean, for a location photographer, this is fantastic because it is completely dust and moisture sealed. Uh, it has been since the S two. Uh, yeah. that's fantastic on location. If the sand is blowing, don't be changing the lenses. <laughs> Both sand is blowing, but <laughs> go in somewhere, hide somewhere where you can change lenses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's pretty amazing on location. Yeah. And with that, I think, uh, we'll conclude today's webinar and, um, we should have, we'll have more, uh, upcoming later this, um, later this month. This month, I guess is almost over. Hard to believe. Uh, we'll be announcing some more for uh, May as well. And uh, you can check those out on our website, camerawest.com forward slash events. 